The city of Piltover and Zon are only a tiny portion of Jinx and Vi's planet called Runeterra, which has a rich history spanning thousands of years, even billions once we start to uncover the secrets of the universe's creation itself. However, in Runeterra, one thing has stayed constant, humans discovering new ways of harnessing the arcane or the unknown and it backfiring on their faces. Why do you think Heimerdinger is so afraid of utilizing the power of Hextech in Season 1? Because in his over 300 year lifespan, he has literally witnessed the sinking of the previous country of Zaun due to human hubris. And with Arcane Season 2 heavily involving one of the major superpowers of this planet, the Empire of Noxus, let me break down the entire timeline of Arcane and the League of Legends universe, including all of the major champions we'll be seeing in the next series or movies set in Runeterra. Billions of years before the creation of the known universe, there was a void of emptiness, or at least, this is what the beings who lived in that nothingness believed. These were the Watchers, who existed in a reality so dark and empty, they didn't even understand that they themselves were alive. They had eyes, but there was nothing to see. Ears, yet nothing to hear. Bodies with nothing to touch. That is until, deep within the void, a light appeared. In an instant, the Watchers were made aware of their own existence, and this angered them. For untold histories, the Void had only known a peaceful slumber, but suddenly, here was this light disrupting their way of living, or at least, their way of not living. As the Watchers approached the light to examine it, they found a peephole into reality, which was ever expanding into their domain. They watched as the first Celestials came into being from the Celestial Realm. Some were formless and needed to be contained in objects, like the champion bard, while others took all shapes and sizes, including the great dragons, Aurelian Soul and Inviolus Vox. Aurelian Soul spread light through the universe, leaving traces of himself everywhere he traveled, which would merge with cosmic dust to form planets and stars. Most were empty worlds, however, occasionally life would sprout on these planets. When it came to one such planet, an unknown group of celestials would gather worlds runes to create Runeterra, the world Arcane takes place in. And it orbits one of Aurelian Soul's stars. Yup, Jinx and Vi's world literally orbits this giant dragon in space. This brings us to 9,000 years before the creation of Noxus. Now, the calendar of Noxus is called BN or before Noxus, so if I say BN, that's what I'm referencing. And currently, the stuff that's happening in Arcane takes place about 970 years after the creation of of Noxus, so just giving you guys a heads up. During these early years of Runeterra's existence, the first seeds of life began to bloom into primordial spirits. Nagakaboros and the Grey Men claimed dominion over life and death. The first demons like Fiddlesticks and Ashlush became known as the Ten Kings, and the earliest Yordles, similar to Heimerdinger, like Nar and Fizz appeared in the spirit realm. This wave of Yordles founded an early Bandle city around the Bandlewood tree, beginning to create small gateways to the physical realm. The continents and islands of Runeterra slowly began to take shape around this time also. For example, the Blessed Isles where Maokai would find the spring of life and use it to create a lush and beautiful forest full of saplings and nature spirits. At the same time, in the Guardian Sea, Fizz joined the early ocean civilizations until the Gigalodons brought them to ruin, resulting in Fizz going into shock and hibernating for a millennia. He'll be back though. Meanwhile, up in the far north, likely where Jace and his mother met that mysterious mage in season 1 who gave him that world room, the icy demigods Orn, Volibear, Anivia, Lidarg, and the Seal Sisters were born and began terraforming the Voriard, a place which would eventually become the Freljord. After the demigods were mortals, trolls, minotaurs, yetis, and of course, humanity would begin to gather gather in early civilizations. Which brings us to the far east on Ionia, where people began to live in harmony with nature and the spirit realm. On Voriard, they gathered in tribes to worship the demigods, and in ancient Camavore, they formed a great kingdom. These early humans of the first lands eventually found their way into a war with a race of sky giants 
known as the Titans. The enlightened mortals of Ionia took power from the spirit realm to become the first Vastaya Shire, who would later be Zaya and Rakan's ancestors. With this new power in hand, the Titans were ultimately defeated, and the Vastaya Shire started living with humanity. It wouldn't be long until the two groups crossbred, creating the first of the Vastaya. These Vastaya would set off on their own to create tribes named after their Vastaya Shire, some choosing to live in Shirima while others immigrated. For example, the Kilash moved to the jungles of Shirima, while the Marai lived in the waters west of Targon. As the Ionians battled the Titans, Freljord was founded in the north, a unification which took over a thousand years. The three sisters I mentioned earlier, Avarosa, Sherilda, and Lysandra were born and dedicated their lives to finding a way to control the vast and powerful magic of this world, which might give us a hint to why Heimerdinger was so reluctant to meddle with magic in season one. That's why the show is called Arcane, you guys. Because by using this arcane power, Avarosa was deafened when she faced the twisting dark beneath the world. Sherilda lost her voice to the first twilight when she tried to command the heavens, and Lysandra aimed to take control of the magic of the demigods. Meanwhile, Anivia wanted to try and talk things out with the sisters, or just farm until 30 minutes to get all of her items, but Volibear wanted to dive the turrets and start a goddamn war. He asked Orn and his followers to create weapons and armor for him, but they refused, resulting in a fierce battle between the two brothers, which ended with Volibear taking Orn's rune-inscribed armor and destroying all of his worshippers. Next was Lysandra. Volibear hunted her down and blinded her with his claws, Defeated in front of her enemy, Lysander turned to the art of dreamwalking to communicate with the Watchers, who still reside in the Void, to make a deal with them. It's kind of like making a deal with the Devils, to be honest, but I'll get to that in just a bit. These Watchers would give the sisters and their followers near immortality and the power to conquer the Freljord, and in exchange, she would prepare Runeterra for the arrival of the Void. Why would you do that? With this new power, the sisters easily defeated the demigods and forced Orn to create the Howling Abyss. Yo, that's where Aram takes place. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ivern the Cruel, a Freljordian marauder, grew angry with the sisters. His warband set out to the sea in the hopes of finding a way to stop them, discovering the eastern first lands where magic was set to originate. Honestly, I'm with Ivern here, bro. They're, they're trying to summon the void. <laughs> Somebody has to stop them. Here, they discovered the God Willow and battled the tree's Vastayan guardians in an attempt to break the enemy's resolve. Of, Ivern cut down the God Willow, but in doing so, he himself was transformed into the sapling of the next God Willow tree. Around 8,000 years before Noxus, the sisters started to quarrel among them, threatening the rule and stability of Freljord. They could not agree on what the future of their domain should look like, and Lysandra's deal with the Watchers displeased her sisters. They believed serving these otherworldly beings would only lead to destruction, something they could physically see as the the sky grew darker and the winds grew colder with each passing day. Read the signs, people! Ultimately, Lysandra lured her sisters to her frost guard citadel, but as they approached, the sisters began to manifest into the Freljord from the Howling Abyss, creating void-born prototypes like Velkaz as they crossed into Runeterra. Seeing the unbelievable horrors and chaos she had unleashed, Lysandra realized- she realizes now, but not when everybody was trying to stop you. You are made of stupid. Lysandra realized how terrible a mistake she had made. With no options left, she drained her allies, the Yetis and Nar of their magic, converting them to the feral monsters they once were. This is why Nar can't speak. But this wasn't enough. She also needed to sacrifice her sisters and their armies to perform an ancient ritual, which entombed the Watchers and Nar in true ice, essentially locking them halfway between the Void and Runeterra. With Freljord more or less secured, while Lysandra watches over the Watchers, we can move to 6,000 years before Noxus with the westward migration. Settlers from the lost Camavoran continent traveled to Sharima and Valeron, bringing 
all of their ancient knowledge, wisdom, and magic with them and founded several vital new nations and cities which would grow into the greatest empires Runeterra has ever known. One group called the Vuru settled on the Serpent Isles and managed to summon the power of the Nagakaboros. Just a bit east, a group of scholars would make their way to the Blessed Isles, where they met with Maokai who gave them the location of the Blessed Water of Life. Meanwhile, Skarner would build the Cardinal Arcology as a gift to the people of Ixtal. Those who lived there began dedicating themselves to mastering elemental magic with Skarner and became the first of the Yuntal. In Sharima, Nerimazeth is created as the new nation's capital. South of the continent, Ikathia was founded as a majocracy under its first mage king. And in a seaport called Osha Vazan, that's where Zan is, between Sharima and Valoran, the wind spirit Janna was worshipped as a savior who appeared in moments of need for those at sea. This nation would eventually become the Zon or the birthplace of Jinxon 5. Finally, way out in the west, humanity discovers Mount Hargon and creates a theocracy around the Celestials which created the mountain. Here, they also come into contact with the Aspects who live beyond Runeterra in a celestial realm. After 1,000 years of expansion, these civilizations were ready to take the next steps towards becoming a massive world power by gobbling up smaller nations like Zon. By 5,000 years before Noxus, the ancient Sharimans followed the instructions of Targon's aspects and used the Sun Disk in their capital to create the first Ascended. These guys wielded godly power, allowing Sharima to become a major world power. The warrior queen, Sataka, wields the Chalisar, which would later become Sivir's weapon. It harnesses power from beyond Targon, which she raises to the sky at the birth of Sharima. Eventually, an attempt at ascension would fail and the sun disk was destroyed, and so the Sharimans would build a bigger and more powerful sun disk with the help of the Ixtali mages. When this sun disk was completed, the Oasis of Dawn appeared within it, spreading its life, giving water throughout the desert and forming the mother of life rivers. This was the official establishment of the Shariman Empire, and as it began its expansion, it swallowed up countless smaller cities and nations, including Ixtal and Oshra Vazan. By 3400 years before Noxus, Sharima had cemented itself in history. As its power grew, so did its number of enemies, and along the south coast, an invading force attacked the city of Old Zureta. Here, Renekton would make his stand and fended off the enemies alone, earning him the title of Gatekeeper of Sharima. He held off these invaders long enough for his brother Nasus to arrive with reinforcements and ultimately Sharima remained safe. Meanwhile, Ikathia's council constantly bombarded the Shariman emperor with requests to ascend some of their more talented citizens to give them some kind of say in the empire. The denial of this request only stood to worsen Sharima's political position and ultimately Zillion was sent to these smaller nations and Ixtal to gather allies for an Ikathian independence movement. However, no one was willing to oppose Sharima and its ascended. Better to be a nation within their borders than to be wiped off the map, right? And this is a sentiment I'm sure a lot of Zonites would agree with in Arcane after Vander's failed revolution before the start of the series due to the fear of the enforcers. And now, even a bigger fish, Noxus, is knocking on Piltover's door to basically annex them in season 2. In fact, in season 2, with Noxus flexing its muscles even more towards the technology of Piltover, this dilemma will be majorly felt. But back to the past, Sharima would continue its rule and dominance until 2500 years before Noxus. But this is where they would begin to falter. It all started with an earthquake in Sabera, which revealed a void rift where the Watchers live. Akathian mages had discovered it during a journey to their capital and believed believed it could be used as a source of power to fight for their independence. The Council of Akathia instituted a new mage king and reinstated the royal guard. With Sijax being a founding member, Zillion opposed all of this, still hoping to work things out diplomatically, but his pleas fell on deaf ears. Inside of Akathia, it is suddenly a crime to be Shariman. Any citizen found to be from the empire is immediately put to death or banished as they ready themselves for for the upcoming war. Shariman towns, such as the one Varus comes from, were attacked and pillaged by the Akathians, and in some cases where they managed to slay a 
defended like Jax did with Baizek. These cities were each liberated from Sharima. Bro, this dude Jax killed a goddamn ascendant with a lamppost. He's, he's just built different. But this disrespect would not stand. And so a force of Shariman ascendant led by Queen Sataka herself was sent to Ikathia with a massive army. This was all part of Ikathia's plan. And as the enemies approached, they tore open the void rift hoping it would consume them. However, that did not happen. Instead, countless Voidborn began crawling into Runeterra as they corrupted the land they tread upon. An unbelievable battle would take place with some ascendant like Aatrox experiencing horrors beyond belief, while others like Sataka would simply be killed. In a last ditch effort, Azillion collected as many Akathian citizens in his tower as possible and then removed the tower from time in order to save them from the terror of this battle. However, he had no way of bringing them back and so to this day they remain frozen in time as he searches for a way to save them. The real turn in the battle would come with Nezu. This was a god warrior from Ixtal with immense elemental magic who promised he could create a weapon to defeat the void in Ikathia and so he produced the floating fortress, the monolith which he and other great mages controlled from within. However, this weapon of living rock was worn down and eroded over weeks of battle and ultimately it crashed into the earth, only serving to spread the void rift even more. Huge portions of the monolith vanished into the void and only Nezuk survived. He pulled himself from the rubble and made his escape, leaving only one piece of his great monolith behind, which would eventually become Malphite in the future. A final option was put forth by an ascendant warrior called Horok, who wielded the nether blade that Kassadin has in the future to cut at the roots of the void. While ascendant twins Sabaka and Sabake assisted in sealing the rift and stopping its spread. While Ikathia fought for its independence and became overrun by the void, Sharima faced its own threats from within. All of Azir's brothers were killed in an attack. However, he was saved by Zerith in the last moment. Because of this, Azir promised to free Zerith and all of Sharima's slaves when he became emperor. To ensure Azir would be able to fulfill this promise, Zerith caused all of his future brothers to be stillborn. And when one finally survived, he opted to kill the queen to stop the problem at its source. From here, he decided to kill the standing emperor, Azir's father as well. This dude's crazy. There was simply no reason to wait for the young king to become emperor anymore in Zareth's mind. When Azir takes the throne, he vows to take revenge against those who killed his parents. And Zareth ensures him that the cause was mages from another kingdom, you fucking rat! Zareth believed Azir would immediately free the slaves as promised. However, every time he brings it up, Azir deflects the conversation. He was working on a solution in secret while he continued to expand the empire. However, Zareth refused to wait and instead decided to try and steal the throne from his old friend. In the year 2000 BN, Azir's priests prepared to perform the ascension ritual on him. And as a last act before ascending, he frees all of Sharima's slaves, much to Zareth's surprise. He had planned to betray Azir and become emperor himself. But now, there was no reason to do that. However, his plans were already in motion, and there was no way to stop him. So, Zareth interrupts Azir's ascension, killing him and becoming ascendant himself. In disrupting the ritual, so much magical energy was released that the entire Shariman capital collapsed, killing its citizens and burying itself under the desert. Zareth, despite being ascended, was locked in the tomb of the emperors with Renekton, where he started to corrupt the crocodile mind, slowly picking away and driving him mad, just a bit more with each passing day. With Sharima's downfall, Ixtal and Zon declared their independence. However, Skarner was left deeply distrustful of the world outside of Ixtal as a result of what he had seen. Without a true emperor, the remaining ascendant of Sharima, the god warriors, were left in control of Runeterra by means of a shaky alliance. And over time, many of them fell to their own ambitions. They believed that 
that they rightfully deserve to rule the world and that all mortals should be enslaved and forced to worship them. As a result, the surviving humans began to referring to these fallen god warriors as the Darken. Over time, the Darken would use ancient magic to craft their flesh and armor together until they were hideous monsters who waged wars against one another to demonstrate dominance. However, some kingdoms such as Camavor in the continent far to the east would make pacts with the Darken. They offered a young Vladimir to the Darken in exchange for Camavor's safety. However, within a year of living under these tyrants, Vladimir was corrupted. They taught him blood magic and sent him back to Camavor to destroy the kingdom. He even took his father's head to his master as a gift. Meanwhile, in Targon, Zoe's previous aspect host, Misha, led an ascended named Kanari to Nasus so they could be given the location of the Chalisar. It would be enough to end the war and unite the Darkin. Kanari gathered several of the ascended and suggested that Azir's descendant be given the Chalisar and become their next ruler. However, another ascended called Suyan refused and tried to steal the Chalisar. Chaos erupted and so Tanari and Misha used the Chalisar to channel their life into an attack which killed most of the Darken present. That's why they needed all the Darken in one place. Tanari was reverted back to being human as a result of the attack and Misha then killed them before approaching her three greatest warriors and taught their weaponsmiths to seal the Darken away into weapons. Meanwhile, the new aspect of war, Pantheon, begins uniting people to fight against the Darken. Seeing this threat on the horizon, Vladimir's Darken master ordered him to march their armies against this new enemy. However, Vladimir betrayed him, killing his master and absorbing some of his power to become effectively immortal. He wasn't the only master of blood magic though. The ascendant Jaulani used Hemomancy to try and end the war by weakening all living beings, ultimately pitting her against Aatrox. By 550 BN, the remaining Darken, such as Aatrox, Varus, and Rost had been defeated and sealed away in weapons, bringing an end to the Darken War. With the Darken defeated, the world would know relative peace for about a century. However, let's check in what's happening in the far north. In the Wildlands, a warlord named Sha'an Uzal crushed every tribe he came across. Uzal was driven by the belief that in death, he would be seen as a champion, earning him a place at the table of the gods for his conquest. However, when he died, he found a gray empty wasteland covered in fog. He began to question himself. Had his faith been been wrong? Was his conquest not impressive enough? As Uzal continued to watch the other wraiths fade into the fog, with time his anger continued to grow, and he refused to become another ghost lost to time. Held together purely by his own rage and ego, Chan Uzal began to make a plan. He whispered through the veil between realms, promising his power to any who would listen, and eventually he was rewarded. A coven of sorcerers were convinced to bring him back from the dead. Oh boy, another piece of ancient power or a strong power that humans can't control messing with the world once again. This dude, Uzal, wanted them to make him stronger than any mortal, so they bound his soul to a dark steel plate armor rather than flesh and bone. And so he arose a revenant of iron and hatred. The sorcerers wished to use him to fight their wars for them, but in an instant, the spirit slaughtered all of them. He had been reborn and now he was free. Sha'an Uzal was gone and Mordekaiser's conquest had officially began in Noxus. His first action was to construct the immortal Bastion to become the center of his empire. With this in place, he started conquering and enslaving anyone who went against him, including a group of Noxy mages who studied ancient celestial magic. Among them was a yordle just like Heimerdinger named Vagar, who Mordekaiser captured and trapped in the physical world. For centuries, Vagar was forced to create enchantments that empowered Mordekaiser in his domain. All the while, the innocent Yordel was slowly corrupted by the evil which surrounded him. Meanwhile, on the coasts of the eastern Valeron, Vladimir demanded the worship and sacrifices of local tribes. Eventually, he was approached by LeBlanc, a member of Mordekaiser's inner circle. LeBlanc is still alive in the future, by the way, and she's going to be influencing the events in season two of Arcane. She was kind of tired and sick of Mordekaiser's bullshit, all right? So, Vladimir and 
and LeBlanc plotted to use the Noxie against Mordekaiser. In 100 years before the founding of Noxus, they managed to sever the soul from Mordekaiser's armor, sending it back to the Grey Realm, or Brazil, where he continues to build power to make his return one day. Oh my god, the Grey World can be read as like, you know, <laughs> you know when you die in League of Legends and you have the Grey screen? Yo, that's actually sick. I just realized that, man. I've been working on this script. <laughs> man, no way. I, I just realized that. That's so cool. W Riot. Like, yo, this is peak. Now, let's move further east from where Noxus and even Ionia is. And if you go on the universe map website, you'll notice that we don't see anything that's east of Ionia. Well, there is a continent way to the east called Camavor. However, 1000 years ago, the events I'm about to explain to you guys, its knowledge has been lost to the greater rune Terra that exists now. So people from Piltover and Zon, they probably don't even know Camavor exists because it's way past the Shadow Isles. So 25 years before the founding of Noxus, 70 years after taking the throne of Camavor, Viego's reign began to crumble when he fell deeply in love with a seamstress named Isolde. They quickly married, but Viego's obsession with this new bride made him neglect his kingdom. As his nation unraveled, enemies conspired to end his rule. Assassins were sent, but Callista, Viego Diego's niece saved him, probably by using her ult. Though the queen was not so fortunate, Isolde was struck by a poisoned blade, and her condition worsened despite the efforts of Camavor's finest doctors and scholars. Desperate to save her, Viego turned to a rumor about the Blessed Isles and their waters of life, sending Callista to retrieve them. Callista's quest was perilous, sailing with Captain Venix on the Daggerhawk. They tried to reach the Blessed Isles, but were thwarted by the magical mists. Losing hope, they sought help from the neighboring Serpent Isles, but the Vuru offered no assistance. So Callista had no choice but to turn to a shady trader named Radu Feroz, who claimed he could guide her to a seer named Soraka. However, after a fruitless search, Callista found only a cryptic message about a golden maiden being her guide. She dismissed it as useless and returned to Venix, only to discover However, Radu had betrayed them and his men slaughtered their crew. Believing their mission had failed, Callista and Venix prepared to return to Camavor alone. On their way back, they encountered a ship under attack by Vestaya. After rescuing its passengers, they met the seer adept Tyrus and his apprentice Rise. Remarkably, the ship's figurehead resembled the Golden Maiden from the Seer's message. Realizing its significance, Callista begged Tyrus for help. Reluctantly, he agreed, and with the use of a magical waystone, they navigated through the mist and reached Helia, the Blessed Isle's capital. Despite Callista's urgent plea for the waters of life, Helia's council delayed their decision. During their wait, an artificer named Jendikaya introduced Callista to relic weapons capable of harnessing magic. This is similar to how Jace using Hextech and the Arcane can wield weapons. However, this was a very rudimentary form over a thousand years ago. After a week, the council refused her request, citing that Isolde wasn't present for the ritual. Furious, Callista prepared to leave, but Airlock Garel, the Warden of Thresholds, yup, this is Thresh, secretly gave her a small vial of the Waters of Life and a Waystone, hoping to gain power in Camavor by aiding her. Hooked her, bro. He hooked Callista with that vial. Though Callista was wary of his motives, she accepted and hurried back to Camavor. Upon her return, Callista found that Viego had succumbed to his madness. He spent lavishly on false cures for his and after weeks of waiting, she had already died. Consumed by grief, Viego locked himself in a tower with Isolde's corpse, using Mikhail's chalice, yeah, that's an item, to slow her decomposition down. His neglect allowed the kingdom to fracture, with regions like Tascaros seceding. But Viego responded with brutality, sending Hecarim and his Iron Order to crush any rebellion. Callista, heartbroken and seeing no hope, refused to reveal the waters of life to Viego. In retaliation, Viego branded her a traitor and had her imprisoned and tortured by Hecarim. Eventually, she was forced
forced to lead an expedition back to the Blessed Isles, accompanied by Hecarim, Venix, and a corpse of Isolde, and also Viego himself. Upon arrival, Viego begged the scholars and healers of Helia to revive Isolde, but only Yorick, a member of the Brethren of Dusk, stayed to assist. Yorick could speak with the dead. He reassured Viego that Isolde had passed on peacefully and mentioned a figure called Gwen. Though this calmed Viego for a time, Thresh tempted him again, claiming the Well of Ages could fully revive Isolde. Driven by desperation, Viego commanded Callista to destroy anyone who stood in his way. However, Callista refused and stood alongside Helia's defenders, but Hecarim betrayed her, striking her down. The Iron Order overwhelmed Helia's forces, and Viego and Garel reached the Well of Ages. There, Viego submerged Isolde's corpse, but the resurrection went horribly wrong. A world rune beneath the well destabilized the magic, and Isolde returned as a wraith. Consumed and furious in her torment, she seized Viego's enchanted sword and drove it through his heart. The cursed blade and the well's unstable magic caused a catastrophic event, unleashing the black mist across the Blessed Isle. As the mist consumed Helia, only a few survivors remained, protected by Tyrus's magic. Among them were Jendakaya, Rise, and Venix. In the aftermath, Jendakaya, inspired by Callista's sacrifice, vowed to fight the Black Mist, founding a new generation of the Sentinels of Light. Meanwhile, Camavor, drained of resources and leadership, collapsed into ruin, fading from history as its legacy was lost to time. After Helia's destruction, a few remaining members of an ancient order from the Blessed Isle set out on a mission to gather and protect the most dangerous artifacts in Runeterra as they struggled to hide knowledge of the world runes or the arcane. As this secret slowly continued to slip, nations became untrusting and fearful of each other as suddenly many groups had access to weapons powerful enough to wipe out their enemies in the blink of an eye. This cold war would stand for about 12 years, bringing us to 13 years before the founding of Noxus. This is when two rival Noxy nations approached Tyrus at the village of Combe. Ultimately, the power of the two world runes would be used here, with Combe and the surrounding territories completely destroyed in an instant. This was the spark which erupted the world in magical warfare. Entire nations are wiped off the map all over the world, and so Tyrus and Rise begin to collect the world runes to put them into hiding so they can't be abused any further. However, just like the Ring of Power, Tyrus himself tried to use these runes, and Rise was forced to kill his master, vowing that he would never use the world runes himself and positioning himself as their protector going forward. Meanwhile, in Sharima, a group of soldiers are attacked by the flora in the gardens of Zir, only for a sorceress to ignite the gardens and destroy everything in the area, leaving it lifeless for hundreds of years until Zyra emerges from the ashes. At the same time, in Ixtal, Skarner convinced the Yuntai to close the borders and hide themselves away by bending nature around them as a shield, completely isolating them from the rest of Runeterra. Then, in the western part of Valoran, refugees take shelter under a forest where trees are imbued with magic nullifying petrocyte, effectively protecting them from the world runes. Here, they established the first Damasian city named Zephira. A man named Kilam, who was married to the aspect of Justice Mihera, fears her divine powers and flees to Zephira with his daughters Kale and Morgana in hopes that the petrocyte will hide them from their mother's sight. As the rune wars come to a close, a group of warrior mages separate themselves from their flesh to enter the spirit realm, where they try to conquer this new world. Their dark magic corrupts the thoughts of mortals all over Runeterra and gives cause for even more horrific acts in the war, ultimately resulting in the creation of the demon Nocturne, who begins to hunt down each dark mage to end their rule. The Rune Wars were about a decade of apocalyptic battles, but with its end, most of the modern civilizations of Runeterra are established. During this conflict, the remaining Noxi are forced to take shelter in the immortal Bastion. 
Union. By the time they emerged, the surrounding area had been ravaged and left barren by the magical fallout. But all the same, they survived. This hardship unified them as a single people. No longer were they several Noxie tribes. From this day on, they would be known as Noxus. And they marked their calendars to reflect the birth of their nation. In the West, the legendary champions Orion and Poppy arrive in Demacia and become beloved heroes. When Orion died, he passed his hammer on to Poppy, saying it should be in the hands of the hero of Demacia. Orlin believed Poppy could keep Demacia safe and whole and help it develop into a great nation. But Poppy, not realizing that Orlon meant her, vowed to find this great hero. Meanwhile, the celestial powers of Kale and Morgana awaken and are used to protect Demacia from threats such as Aatrox and his followers. Eventually, Morgana learns of a hidden wave of enemies attacking the city and leaves the front line to save them. But Kale simply believed her sister was abandoning the fight. Kale began leading a judicious order to enforce the law and hunt down rebels as Morgana tried to rehabilitate anyone humble enough to admit guilt. However, Kale's followers started resenting Morgana, and Kale's protege Ronus even tried to imprison her, though he died in attempting this. Kale was so angered at this that she summoned a divine fire to cleanse the city of its sins. But Morgana did all she could to protect the innocent. Their battle would rage above Damasi until their father Kilam cried out as he died in the collateral damage. Seeing this, both sisters chose to leave Damasia. Over time, the identity of the sisters is forgotten. But as the kingdom of Damasia puts in place its first royal family in year 292, the winged sisters still act as a symbol of their nation. Damasia soon began looking for ways to incorporate petrocyte into their military, and the sculptor Doran is hired to make a moving petrocyte shield. However, instead, he constructed Gallio, a living petrocyte golem. When a force of invading mages attacked, Gallio swooped in to protect Damasian soldiers. However, after the battle, he returned to his pedestal and stopped moving, leaving his story to fall into legend. Meanwhile, in Noxus, the noble houses aimed to unify all of Runeterra under one banner, establishing the Empire of Noxus. They immediately began annexing the surrounding territories. In year 772, Oshara Vazan put in place a plan to use thousands of Chemtech bombs to destroy Isthmus. This is a region connecting Valoran and the Shuriman continent. In doing so, they'd be able to create a safe and efficient passage for sea travel between Eastern and Western Valoran. However, disaster struck. The bombs triggered a catastrophic earthquake, which not only destroyed Isthmus, but also sank a large district of Oshara Vazan and thousands of her citizens along with it, leaking poisonous gas into the city and its surroundings. It was only with the help of Janna, who blew away most of the toxic fumes that the people here managed to survive. And that's how Zon ended up sunken below Piltover. In 787, the Serpent Isles became a hotbed for immigration from places like Damasia, Freljord, and Ionia. The Vuru allowed these outsiders to settle in the southern bay, and this quickly developed into the port city of Bilgewater. Also, you remember Fizz? He finally awakens from his hibernation and chooses to live around this area. Finally, by 790 AN, Oshara Vazan has undergone extensive reconstruction to make it livable again. They also constructed the sun gates that regulate the ocean passage which the city had sunk into. Controlling this waterway meant controlling transport and trade, making the newly developed district over the Pilt River very wealthy. The merchants who controlled this trade route wanted to differentiate themselves from the lowly people living in Oshara Vazan, and so they formed Piltover to symbolize their position above them. To celebrate their newfound success, Progress Day was established to remember the anniversary of the Sun Gate's opening and the establishment of Piltover. However, the Piltovians were not the only ones benefiting from this new trade route. Noxus, a nation built on barren and decrepit land, now had a simple and efficient way to gather resources from across its empire without needing to rely solely on the land route. 
By this point, most of central Valoran belonged to Noxus and they continued to march their soldiers west over to the next country. While pretty much all nations to this point had been easy to dominate, they came across Demacia in 892. While the Noxians had been a brutal offensive force, the Demacians were experts at defending themselves and quickly pushed the invaders away beyond the walls of Havardis. Sion was a furious at these setbacks and turned his warband towards Havardis to reclaim the land they had just lost. He met the enemy in battle and was immediately outnumbered and overwhelmed. However, he alone persisted. Pierced by dozens of arrows and spears, Sion trudged forward until he found King Jarvan I, grabbed him by the throat and strangled him to death. With Sion only allowing himself to die once he knew he had defeated the enemy. Both groups would then return to their homes, Damasians to mourn their king and Noxians to pay respect to Sion, entombing him inside a monument dedicated to his honor. For the next 50 years, Damasia actively fought to free central Valoran from the Noxians, pushing their forces back to the capital. However, in 942, Sion's tomb was opened. The Grand General of the Empire, Boram Darkwill, allied himself with the Black Rose. This is a faction in Noxus which has a rich history and I'm not gonna go into this whole area of league lore because it's a lot and Arcane Season 2 is gonna flesh it out even more but I am planning on doing a whole video on Noxus and just the Empire and the political goings of the Empire and the Black Rose so hit that subscribe button, click that notification bell, all of these league videos are about to be peak. Anyway, the Black Rose is led by LeBlanc and Vladimir to reanimate the long dead hero hero of war using forbidden magic. However, this new Scion's bloodlust was uncontrollable. He was deemed too dangerous and ultimately Noxus had to imprison him below the immortal bastion to prevent his rage from turning against them. In an attempt to regain their former glory, in 974, Noxus began expanding southwards. Over the next decade, they'd make preparations as they slowly annexed and recruited nearby regions and by 984, they were ready for a full-scale invasion of Ionia. Almost immediately, they take the fortress of Phylor and use this as their base of operations for the remainder of the invasion. The Noxians even manage to convert several Vestayan tribes into allies. It's not all easy going though, as in 986, Leeson and Udir reunite with several other monks to defend the Hirana monastery and successfully push back the Noxian forces. On top of that, when Noxus attacks the town of Palace, two people named Kai and Valmar fight to stop them. In the conflict, the two fall into a pit and awaken the darkened Varus, who fuses with both of them and defeats the invaders before leaving Ionia. At the same time, Swain challenges Irelia's army and loses his arm in the process. Swain was then taken away from the battlefield and takes control of Raum, the demon of secrets, before returning to Noxus, where he was dishonorably discharged. In year 989, Swain then enacts a coup in Noxus, killing Borum Darkwell, and within a year, he pulls most of the Noxian forces from Ionia. He then proposes a creation of the Triferix of Noxus with three individuals standing as symbols of the nation. Swain represents the vision of Noxus, Darius represents its might, and the Faceless represents its guile. As the Noxus leave, a power vacuum is created in Ionia which both the Navori Brotherhood and the Shadow Order attempt to take control of. Meanwhile, the Noxian Cassiopeia, a noble from Noxus, hires Sivir to take her to a fabled lost city. When they enter the tomb of the emperors, Cassiopeia realizes that Sivir's weapon, the Chalisar, is a key and betrays her to take it. However, as she places the weapon in the lock, the Guardian Curse is triggered and she is transformed by poisons into a Goragon like creature at the same time opening this tomb releases both Zareth and Renekton from their prison and so Renekton sets out to find and kill his brother Nasus. Cassiopeia returns back to Noxus and uses her new powers for the Black Rose. As for Sivir, she is the descendant of Azir and her blood resurrects him. Seeing her mortally wounded, the Emperor brings her to the Oasis of Dawn, saving her life. In doing so, he becomes worthy of ascension and becomes a god warrior. 
And with this transformation, Sharima's lost capital and the Sun Disk slowly begin rising from the sands. In an instant, this ancient kingdom is rebuilt, and Azir terraforms the land to recreate the utopia it once was. At the same time, Zareth is building up his own power in the city of Narimazen, and Nasus sets off on a mission to stop him. Soon after, Talia finds Sivir wounded outside of Vekaura. Her blood is attracting both Nasus and Zareth towards her. Nasus makes it there first and gives the girls an amulet to keep them hidden from Zareth and fights the mages when he arrives. However, he ultimately loses that battle, but still created enough of an opening for Talia and Sivir to escape. The following year, 991, Lucian and Seta are looking for a cure to Senna's curse in an ancient vault when they are attacked by Thresh, resulting in Senna's soul being sealed away in Thresh's lantern. In 994, a harrowing begins, sweeping over Bilgewater with Hecram and Thresh leading its path. Lucian, Olaf, and Misfortune all come together to fend off the harrowing until Alawi calls Nagakaboros to shower light over Bilgewater and repel the mist. In the battle, Lucian learns that Senna's soul is imprisoned in Thresh's lantern and vows to save her and destroy the Black Mist. The next year, he travels to the Shadow Isles and finally manages to defeat Thresh, saving his wife and allowing her to reform herself as a wraith with a relic cannon that she uses to scare off Thresh. Finally, in 996, Viego begins to awaken, which unbeknownst to him also brings Gwen to life. The Black Mist unleashes a harrowing all across Runeterra, corrupting countless people as it passes through them, ultimately leading to the Sentinels of Light recruiting several new members including Vayne, Olaf, Riven, Irelia, Diana, Graves, Rengar, and Pike. It's a Avengers level threat. The Sentinels head to the Shadow Isles with the help of Yorick and take on the Mist. Viego, along with Vex, manages to capture Senna, Gwen, and the Maiden with several shards of Isolde's soul. Then, pulling all of these shards together, he revives Isolde only for Akshan to kill her with his Absorber. This severs Viego's connection to the Black Mist, and the Sentinels finish him off with Gwen tying him down on Camivore with needles made of hallowed mist. With Viego defeated, all those corrupted by the harrowing return to normal, and the newest Sentinels return their weapons with the exception of Vayne, who becomes a permanent member. Finally, with Viego gone, Thresh takes control over the Black Mist and heads to Noxus. And this all brings us back to the lead up to the modern day with Arcane. The people of Piltover continue to rule over and subjugate those living in the lanes below, leading to a rebellion effort which is ultimately put down with countless losses on both sides. This includes Vi and Powder's parents. As a result, they are adopted by the leader of the resistance, Vander. Over the years, Vander makes a deal with Piltover's Sheriff Grayson to essentially keep the peace, but one day Vi, Powder, Clagger, and Milo sneak into Jace's apartment in Piltover and disrupt magical crystals which cause an explosion, collapsing a huge part of the building. The kids escape, but in doing so, put Vander in a rough situation where he needs to offer someone up to the enforcers to face consequences. At the same time, Silco works with Singe to create a shimmer variant that can supercharge his soldier and uses one of them to capture Vander and kill Grayson. Vi leads an effort to save Vander but leaves Powder behind because she's unlucky, but she follows them anyway. Releasing a magic crystal's energy that she stole from Jace's home through one of her inventions, which leads the entire facility to be destroyed, resulting in the deaths of both Clagger and Milo, also severely injuring Vi and Vander. Now weakened, Vander is killed by Silco, leaving Vi furious with her sister and disowning her. In the end, Silco adopts Powder because he sees himself in her and Vi is taken to prison by an enforcer called Marcus. All the while in Piltover, Jace tries to sell the idea of mixing magic with technology through Hextech. Heimerdinger severely disapproves, as he probably knows about some of the terrors that happened 1000 years ago through the Rune Wars when they messed with the Arcane, or just the founding of Piltover when Osir Vazan destroyed pretty much their entire country <laughs> and causing Janna to use her alt to save everyone. But Victor and Chancellor Madeira side with Jace and ultimately his invention is picked up for further study. Years later, Jace's Hextech is massively successful 
successful, most iconically in allowing the creation of the hex gates which allow hyperspeed travel, which is unbelievably valuable for a nation founded on trade and commerce. Meanwhile, Powder is going by Jinx now and working for Silco as he continues to build towards the lanes becoming an independent nation and gathers wealth selling Shimmer. Jinx steals one of Jace's new and improved hex core crystals, creating a state of widespread panic where Piltover's council becomes fearful of what weapons the lanes might be able to produce. As a result, blockades are put in place and the military is put on defensive watch to stop things from escalating further. Caitlyn begins looking into Soko from behind the scenes and releases Vi from prison to help with the investigation, only to come across Jinx and see how different and insane these few years have made her. At the same time, Heimerdinger is removed from control of Piltover and Jace takes his place on the council as a more forward-looking figurehead for Piltover. Jace also starts seeing Mel Madarda, another council member and the daughter of the Noxian Madarda family led by Ambessa Madarda. Ambessa sees Jace as the answer to all of Nox's problems. It is a vast but barren nation reliant on trade and imports for survival, but it is also a conquesting empire which needs to send its troops long distances to engage in battle. Hexgate technology would essentially make them an unstoppable force which could overwhelm any and all opponents. As tensions escalate, Silco and Jace discuss an option for peace. Silco wants a free and independent nation of Zaun, taking its name from Osha Vazan, while Jace demands he hand over Jinx for her crimes. Ultimately, Silco is willing to throw away his lifelong dream to protect his daughter, but due to a miscommunication, Jinx captures him, Vi, and Caitlyn, sitting them all down for one last family meeting before killing Silco and firing a rocket fueled by the hex core at the council building. And that's where Arcane Season 1 ends, and since Season 2 isn't out yet, uh, this is where our story ends for now. Thank you so much for watching, you guys. Hit that subscribe button and turn the notification bell on. I'm a league addict myself, and talking about all of this lore, it's been a treat. And once again, some of the recent events that are happening in the lore, right, might move them up a bit or down a bit. Like some of the stuff that's happening in Ionia, they might say that it all happens after Arcane. So we might get a Ionia series next um, and we see the Noxus versus Ionia war, or it might have already happened. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for watching. See you guys in the next video. Watch this other banger video on screen right now.